Hi, it's Carly McAvoy. Today we're talking about sampling distribution of means, and I'm using the website listed at the top of this document from Online Stat Book, which is an open resource book that anyone's welcome to go and check out online. Um, we're going to look at sample sizes of 25, starting with a parent population. So when I look at my parent population, let's just first check it out. We have a normal distribution. It starts small, it gets bigger in the middle, goes back small again. Um, and you can look over here and see that our mean is 16 as well as our median. When we have a normal distribution, we would expect our mean and our median to be equal. And then our standard deviation is 5. So what I want to do is, is pull 25 values out of that parent population to create a sample. So I'm going to use this animation piece. Notice down here I have said I want 25. I could do various sizes. And I'm going to animate that. That's going to show the 25 data values dropping. We would expect that the majority of our data values are going to come from the center because that's where the majority of the data values are in the parent population. But there always is some on the ends, and if it's randomly choosing, it has it may choose some of those. And then you can look down here at our, our distribution of the means. This is the average of all these populations that we're going to do. So if I did that, I have one. This is the average of that sample that I just did. And I could do that again, have 25 values drop, and then it would tell me, well, what's the average of, what is the average of our sample look like, the distribution of the means. And now we start to have um, two values. They weren't exactly the same, but they kind of fall in the middle. And you can see here that I have the mean right now is zero because it's where we are right now. Well, let's go ahead and do, let's say, uh, 10,000 of those. So we had dropped that 10,000 times. The average should start to look like this. And what I want you to see is that the mean uh, is going to start representing a bell-shaped curve just like the other one is. But let's go back and answer the questions on our sheet. Um, what is the relationship between the various windows? Um, the parent population shows the population data of all the data. So that's your population, all the data that you have. And the sample data is just a one random sample from the population. And I was using 25, so we have a uh, sample with 25 data values in it. And the distribution of the mean was collecting sample means. So we're looking at the mean of those 25 values that we took. And we can have many of those to start to form other answers. Um, and then we're talking about what does the mean refer to? Um, and so if you think about uh, mean for the population, we know it's mu, and that just is the population mean. Whereas when we have a distribution of means, we use this mu with a subscript of x bar. And what that's saying is we have the average of all of those small samples, the x bar being our sample. If we take the average of those samples, sample means, then we start to have the distribution of means. So describe the shape of the histogram created when I click on the button. Um, so when you're clicking on the button, uh, it takes, I can do 10,000 samples at a time, which I did. And I kind of jumped ahead and, and did that already. Um, in what days does the distribution significantly vary from the, differ significantly from the parent distribution at the top of the page? Well, what I want you to see when you're looking at that what I want you to notice is that this is bell-shaped sh and this has a bell-shaped also. So that's one of the things they have in common. So we would say that um, they have a normal distribution. So that's something they have in common. The parent and the distribution of means are the same. And then if you look also at the, um, the means here, this mean is 16 and the mean down here is 16.01. We could do 100,000 of those instead of 10,000, and you can see that now the mean is 16, and so is the mean of the parent population. Those two things become equal as you do more and more samples. So the means in virtually are the same when you're doing something from a normal distribution and you're taking a sample of that. You can expect to see the mean be the same, especially 
as you take more and more of those samples. And notice also that because this is a normal distribution, our median also matches that. So that's something important to realize. I don't know if I uncovered that. They're normally distributed, distributed and the means are the same. That is, mu is the same as that uh, average for the distribution of means. Those are going to be the same as we take more and more from a normal population. And then we didn't look at this yet, but we'll go back and see it. The distribution has a smaller standard deviation. When we take averages, just averages of the means, the extreme values are not as effective. And we can go back and look at that. Um, here it is. I'm having trouble finding all my windows. Um, but we can look at the standard deviation up here. It's five, but the standard deviation here is one. So we don't we start to not see such a great uh, standard deviation when we're just looking at averages of means, because each of those samples may have a smaller range, and then when you start to average those up, your standard deviation is actually going to become smaller with the smaller one. Now, if I did the same thing for a sample size of five, let's say, and I can animate it and show you, we're just going to have five values, we can still start to see that doesn't mean that we're not going to get um, the same mean and standard deviation as we go forward in that. We can start to do it over and over and over. If I do it 100,000 times, you can see that we do have that bell shape. We have the mean and the standard deviation. Or mean and median, sorry, are the same. But what we see is that our standard deviation is still smaller. We had a 5 up here and we had 2.24. But when we did 25 values before, our standard deviation was around 1. I think it was, I can't remember now, I think it was about 1. So we have 2.24. So if you have a smaller sample, um, then you're going to get a little bit bigger standard deviation. So if I animate that again, maybe you can see why. And the good example of Julia Trude was saying was tug of war. If you're doing tug of war and you have an outlier value, this is one person against all, a one value against all these, and it could have a greater tug. Whereas if you have something like 25 values, then you have a, an outlier, but the outlier is tugging against all these values. Maybe there's three outliers here, but it's tugging against all these values in the middle. And so what happens when um, your sample is smaller is those outer outliers have a little bit more of a tug in the tug of war game, and they can cause your standard deviation to get a little bit larger. And with the larger samples, your standard deviation is going to be smaller because there's so many values in the middle working against those outliers. So that's that. I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, and so what we have here is that if a sample size is small, like n equals 5, the standard deviation will be greater. And again, that's because if one of those outliers come up in a small sample, it's going to have more uh, effect on the sample because there's not as many to balance that out. And then it says, what if the parent population is skewed? What does the distribution look like with n equals 2? And what does the distribution uh, look like with n equals 25? Well, we can just go in and look at that and see. Um, if we go back into the site and have a skewed distribution, right now it's normal, but we can skew it. Skewing means that you have a, lo a lot of your values here at the beginning, and then they trail off like this. Well, this is not good for us when we want to do our calculations and things like that. We don't really want a skewed population. And if we have um, a 2 and we animate that, just two values, and we do that 100,000 times, you start to see that our distribution of our means uh, mimics our parent population, and that is that it's also skewed, and we don't want that. When we're trying to do calculations and things, we don't want a skewed distribution. But if we change that to 25 and then do uh, 100,000 animations of that, um, then we start to see that we do have a bell-shaped or normal shape for our distribution. Also, you can see that our mean is reflected here. 
Um, it's still, our, our median is not the same as our mean up here. Remember when you have a, something that's skewed to the right, you're going to see your mean be a little higher than your median. But down here where we start to have a normal distribution, you can see that those come closer in line with each other. So that's good news because if we have a distribution that, a pop parent population that's skewed, we can still make use of that if we pull enough values, a uh, sample size big enough to make that work. And that can vary, but let's go back and see um, what I have that I wanted to make sure that you saw in here. For sample sizes like n equals 2, the distribution will be skewed. We don't want that. If we want to use it for calculations, that's not a good thing. However, if we have 25, um, the distribution of the means will be normal, which is what we want, and the means of the population and the distribution of means will be equal. We just saw that, and the standard deviation will be smaller. I didn't actually point that out, but just once again, here's a standard deviation of 6.22. Standard deviation here is 1.25. We expect that standard deviation to be smaller in our distribution of means than it was in the parent population. So that is what we expect to see, and we did see it there. Um, and then, whoops. Um, so that tells us that if we want to use a distribution that is skewed, we need to have larger population sizes. So that's something to take into mind. And knowing how large your population size is, that's a calculation for another day. It varies depending on what um, values you're using. All right, and then that leads us to the definition of the central limit theory, a theorem, excuse me, uh, the mean of a random sample is a random variable whose sampling distribution can be approximated by a normal model. So we just saw if we had a normal model, we can approximate what our sample is going to be. The larger sample, the better the approximation will be. So that's always good to, the, to get a larger sample. However, there's a limit to how large of a sample you can get when you're doing statistics. So we can't just say infinite. Um, the central limit theorem requires the following conditions, independent assumptions, that is the sampled values must be independent of each other. There's a randomized condition, the samples need to be randomly chosen or it's not safe to assume independence. Um, sometimes that's a little hard to prove, we sort of assume that a lot of times with data. And then the sample size condition is the crucial thing that we just saw, a normal model is appropriate if the sample is large enough. Um, this is very vague and determined on a case-to-case -case basis, but in general, the more skewed a distribution is, the larger the sample needs to be. And if the population is normal to start with, then the sample size condition no, is really not required. As long as we start with the normal population, we can assume that our samples will be, but once it's skewed, we really need to think about that large enough population. All right, I'm going to stop there. Have a fantastic day, and I'll talk to you next time.